Good evening, everyone. This is a panel discussion on remembrance. We're here to talk about a little known part of American history that's seldom taught, seldom discussed, and had a tremendous impact on the history of America. We're talking about racial terror yeah. and my name is attorney Jacqueline Hubbard. I will at this time turn over the program to our moderator, the Honorable Charles E. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, before we get started oh, with the business of the panel, I would like to now introduce uh, you to our esteemed panel. Um, first is Dr. Julie Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong is a professor of English at the University of South Florida at St. Petersburg. She is a civil rights and Southern literature scholar. Dr. Armstrong is the author of The Cambridge Companion to Civil Rights Literature and Mary Turner and the Memory of Lynching. She has been the recipient of the Chancellor Award for Excellence in Research and Creative Art. Our second panelist is Dr. Raymond Arsenault. Dr. Arsenault is the Emeritus John Hope Franklin Professor of Southern History at the University of South Florida. He is a specialist in the political, social, and environmental history of the American South. He is the author of Freedom Riders, a companion to the PBS series of the same name, and most recently, Arthur Ashe, A Life, the definitive biography of Arthur Ashe. Dan Boxer leads the Boxer Diversity Initiative. The Boxer Diversity Initiative promotes diversity and inclusion to encourage a better understanding of the diverse groups, racial, religious, and gender in Southwest Florida. The Boxer Diversity Initiative is spearheading the Community Remembrance Project in the Minnesota region with groups such as Minnesota Asala, Newtown Alive, and the Sarasota African American Cultural Coalition. Jacqueline Hubbard is an attorney, a community activist, and volunteer. She is the president of the St. Petersburg chapter of Asala, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. She served as the St. Petersburg Community Remembrance Project Coalition liaison for this project. And finally, Andrew Walker. Andy Walker is a native of St. Petersburg, also a community, a community activist and volunteer. He is director of health and wellness for the National Senior Games Association and an original member of the St. Petersburg Community Remembers the Project Coalition. During the period between the Civil War and World War II, thousands of African Americans were lynched in the United States. Lynchings were violent and public acts of torture that traumatized black people throughout the country and were largely tolerated by state and federal officials. These lynchings were terrorism. Terror lynchings peaked between 1880 and 1940 and claimed the lives of African-American men, women, and children who were forced to endure the fear, humiliation, and barbarity of this widespread phenomenon unaided. St. Petersburg and Pinellas County and the entire Florida Gulf Coast was not spared from this terror against its own citizens. So we'll begin tonight with Jacqueline Hubbard, who will speak to us now and give us a brief history of lynching in America. Ms. Hubbard. Yes, <clears throat> and I would like to acknowledge my uh, gratitude to the Equal Justice Initiative for preparing so many written books regarding this particular subject. W.E.B. Du Bois stated in Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880, that the success of the political doctrine of racial separation united the planter class and the poor white 
because the theory of race was supplemented by a carefully planned and slowly evolved method that drove a wedge between the poor white and the Negro. This wedge was so completely uh, drawn that there is probably not today a set of workers or laborers who having been kept apart yet having similar interests, hate and fear each other so deeply. And whose notion of common interest seems to pass by the wayside. Every right afforded the black race was taken away and given to poor whites as they struggled against the same oppressor. They failed to realize the logical outcome of such racism would be mob violence and lynching as spectacle against Black Americans. As W.B. Du Bois stated, the use of the color line has been successively used to divide the electorate and oppress the Negro. By 1875, after the end of the Civil War in 1865, Northern support for the civil rights of Black people in the South was definitely declining. Many people who had supported the civil rights of Black people through the egalitarian policies of Reconstruction were beginning to disappear. Northerners complained of being tired of supporting Black Americans in their quest for equality. For four years, the Union had fought a highly destructive civil war, resulting in the estimated deaths of 750,000 people. There have been fights in Congress there had been fights in Congress to enact a series of laws after the Civil War to protect the rights of the newly emancipated, including President Grant's deployment of Union troops throughout the South for the protection of the newly emancipated. This resulted in the short-lived but highly productive era of Reconstruction. Most historians date this between 1865 and 1877, although W.B. Du Bois uh, continues it to 1880. President Grant was fairly unrelenting in his efforts to ensure that the previously enslaved had their civil rights, especially the right to vote. Reconstruction required the heavy hand of federal protection. President Grant understood that the right to vote would be the saving grace for black people in a democracy and was fairly unrelenting in his quest to protect the vote for African-Americans. He sent federal troops to the South to ensure compliance after the Civil War. This concept was called radical reconstruction. In 1867, Congress passed the Reconstruction Acts. However, as early as 1873, a series of Supreme Court decisions limited the scope of Reconstruction era laws and federal support for the so-called Reconstruction Amendments and the Civil Rights Act of 1867. The United States Supreme Court did not rule upon the constitutionality of the Reconstruction Acts themselves, but gradually acceded to the disablement of them due in large part to the lack of enforcement of both these acts and the civil rights amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. For instance, in 1873, the Supreme Court held that the 14th Amendment only protected privileges and immunities of persons as citizens of the United States, but not as citizens of the states. And I refer you to a book entitled Reconstruction After the Civil War by John Hope Franklin. After losing the Civil War over the institution of slavery, angry Southern Blacks resorted to intimidation and violence to keep Blacks from voting, among other things. This was to restore white supremacy that clearly had existed during the time of enslavement. The lack of support from the judiciary and other factors, such as the inability of President Grant to run for reelection because of cancer, led to what we call the Compromise of 1877, which is considered by most historians to be the date Reconstruction ended an open governmental support of racial oppression began again. 
Further, an economic depression during the time led to discontent within the Republican Party, which had been in the White House since 1861. As the 1876 presidential election approached, President Grant declined to seek a third term. A third term. The Republicans nominated Rutherford B. Hayes, who was the governor of Ohio, and the Democrats nominated Samuel Tilden. Hayes clearly favored an end to Reconstruction and the restoration of white supremacy in the South. In an article, a fairly recent article, I'll quote to you, during Reconstruction, a raft of attempted insurrections flared up across the former Confederacy. Violent storms of white supremacists rocked swaths of the South, all aimed at undoing the Union's victory during the Civil War, as well as the civil rights gains made shortly thereafter. Racial equality, civil rights protection, basic recognition of democratic outcomes, all were targets of rampaging white terrorists using violence to launch themselves to power once more. The numbers are hazy, but dozens perished as a direct result of insurrection, part of the thousands of victims of white supremacist political violence immediately following the Civil War. In 1876, as I said before, resulted in a compromise because there were 20 disputed electoral votes. Tilden had 184 of the 185 electoral votes needed and Hayes uh, had 165 votes and there were 20 electoral votes that were hotly contested. Uh, what happened was a compromise was reached and the Democrats agreed that if Hayes would take away the, the federal troops that were in the South and go easy on the, the white populations there, they would accept his victory and give him the 20 disputed electoral votes. He agreed uh, to do so and withdrew all federal troops from the South. Now understand what that meant that meant that Blacks in the South were left to the Southern electoral process and the people in power to protect them, which of course they had never done and never would do. Um, this deal was struck to resolve this dispute and it's called the Compromise of 1877. After the withdrawal of the federal troops, a period of racial terror lynchings began in earnest. The reintroduction and enforcement of Jim Crow laws came up again. Institutionalized racial segregation continued in earnest throughout the South. White supremacy increased the violent and bloody process of public lynchings that lasted at least until the 1950s. In 1957, there became a change in the focus of the US Supreme Court, and they ruled in Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Since then, the Equal Justice Initiatives, Initiative has counted over 6,200 racial terror lynchings during this period. At least four of those occurred here in Pinellas County, Florida, and today, a friend of mine just sent me a notice of another one that occurred in a county near here. Um, this period of American apartheid lasted nearly 80 years. It followed enslavement, civil war, and reconstruction. This period was probably, probably, probably the most racially segregated period in American history. Almost all interaction between the races was forbidden and whites brutally enforced the separation by legally enacting laws and mounting terror campaigns, particularly in the South. This resulted in the institutionalism of white supremacy. 
mass incarceration of black men, racial separation and segregation in American jobs, schools, sports, marriage, housing, and every other aspect of American life that ultimately bled into the entire country. Not until the 1960s did this violent racial suppression come to a temporary end. And how ironic, after President Obama's two terms in office in ending in 2016, anti-Black racism has begun to rise again, resulting in the tumultuous and disputed election we just went through in 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Ray Arsenault will now discuss some of the specific incidents of lynching in this area. Dr. Arsenault. Ray, you need to unmute. There we go. I'm unmuted now. Okay. Can you yep, hear me? I hear you. Okay, great. Sorry. So I'm going to talk about St. Petersburg's history, its racial history, and the, th the three lynchings that we know about that took place in the early 20th century. There may be others, but the historical record so far has only uncovered three in the city. Uh, St. Petersburg, uh, the city itself uh, as a town goes back to 1888 when the railroad came across the state, the Orange Belt Railway. Um, at that point, there had only been one black family living here, the Donaldson family, which, who came in 1868 from Alabama. Uh, but when the railroad came in 1888, uh, there were roughly a hundred uh, African-American workers who helped build the railroad and a little about a, more than a dozen of them stayed once the railroad was completed. And that was sort of the basis for the black community uh, in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, and over time, over the next 15 years or so, the community grew so that by the turn of the century, roughly one quarter of the population of St. Petersburg, which was a very small place, only 1400 people in 1900, uh, was, was African-American. There was, you might say, cradle-to-grave segregation, but it wasn't a, a completely codified Jim Crow system at that point. It was, it was uh, uh, mandated mostly by custom rather than law. That would change later. Uh, so uh, relations were, compared to what they were later, you know, I think r relatively peaceful, uh, although there was clear racial discrimination and separation. The, the first lynching in St. Petersburg uh, took place in 1905, just two years after the city was incorporated. Uh, and it, the victim was John Thomas, uh, who was a young African-American man uh, from, from South Carolina. And that's an important part of this because he was considered to be an outsider. He was not a member of the African-American community in St. Petersburg. Um, but on Christmas day in, in 1905, uh, he was arrested for disorderly conduct by uh, police chief uh, James Mitchell. And while Mitchell was taking him to the jail, uh, they had a fight and uh, John Thomas had a knife and he, he, he stabbed chief Mitchell to death. Uh, they, they, Mitchell died in the street. They took John Thomas to the jail. Uh, it wasn't long before a mob uh, gathered and demanded that uh, they be given um, John Thomas to, to exercise vigilante justice on him. Uh, they put a ladder up to the second floor of the jail. He was, he was, his, his cell was on the second floor and they shot, shot him to death through, through the window. It was a relatively small mob, but then they, they, they weren't satisfied with that. Uh, they, they went down and a few other people joined the mob and they broke open the jail doors uh, and they took the body out and mutilated it. That was very common in, in lynching uh, situations. Uh, the body was mutilated, often burned at the stake. Parts of the body were separated and sold as souvenirs. And it was a pretty gruesome, terribly gruesome uh, ritual. Uh, but the, the press hardly mentioned it. Um, they, it didn't cause much of a stir. Uh, and it seemed to be an anomaly. But nine years later, in, in 1914, community, of course, was much larger now, a population of about 8,000. On November 10th, 1914, 
uh, Edward Sherman, who was a local kind of developer. He was a photographer, actually, who'd been in the city for a few years, and then he decided to become a, a real estate developer. And he was uh, building a subdivision uh, called Wildwood Gardens out on Johns Pass Road, which is now 30th Avenue North. It was really out in the boondocks in those days. And uh, he, he, had, he had employed 11 African-American workers to help clear the land. Uh, he, uh, two of them were um, John Evans and Eugene Tobin, and they were fired uh, three days before Edward Sherman's body was discovered. He was, he was shot to death by someone, we'll never know now. Um, his wife, Mary, uh, was, was, was assaulted with a pipe and uh, uh, possibly uh, sexually assaulted. That was, at least that was, that was implied in the newspaper uh, coverage. Uh, again, we'll never know for sure what actually happened to her. Um, but they started looking, roaming the black community of St. Petersburg to find someone to blame for Edward Sherman's uh, death. Uh, and they, they fastened on, on John Evans, who was a, 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 one of the laborers working for, for Sherman. He was from Dunellen, up in the central part of the state. He was not, again, he'd only been here a few weeks. Uh, nobody in the black community really knew him. He was staying in a rooming house in, in downtown St. Petersburg. Anyway, they, they, somebody, they figured since he'd been fired three days earlier, he was a prime suspect. They took him before Mrs. Sherman, who was in the hospital, and she said, that's not the man. That's not the man that killed my husband. That's not the man that assaulted me. And so they let him go. But then they searched his, the rooming house where he lived and they found some bloody clothes. And they saw that was the smoking gun for them. So the mob grabbed him, took him back to uh, Mrs. Sherman. Uh, and once again, uh, she said, that's not the man. Uh, they spent a number of hours torturing him, trying to torture him into a confession. He refused to do so. Um, and uh, uh, he, was, he was returned to jail. And finally, uh, the, uh, it, we know, we'll probably never know all of the details, but it, it, it seems that the city fathers, the leaders of the city, um, were worried that th this, uh, this death of Edward Sherman, he was a developer from Camden, New Jersey. They, were, they wanted other people to come and invest. The, the tourist trade was rising in 1914. The city was, was booming. Um, so uh, they wanted to show ironically that St. Petersburg had law and order. They had, to, they had to bring somebody to justice. And so actually this, this group of city leaders in secret, uh, the next afternoon uh, planned a lynching. It was not a spontaneous mob at all. It was planned by the, the members of the coroner's jury, 15 leaders of the community. Um, by this time, many, many people knew uh, they, they, they went and uh, took him out of the jail, marched him down Central Avenue, down to 9th Street, which was now Martin Luther King, and two blocks south to the center of what was known as Cooper's Quarters, which was one of the two main black neighborhoods in St. Petersburg. They, they, they put a noose around his neck. They strung him up on a telephone pole. Uh, he was a gruesome, gruesome sight. Uh, there were probably as many as 2,000 people there. Uh, um, pretty much almost half, or maybe even more than half of the white population of, of, of St. Petersburg. Uh, as he's, he's wrapped his legs around the pole, trying to, trying to save himself, a, a woman from a car pulled out a shotgun and shot him to death. Uh, but that didn't satisfy the mob. And for about 10 minutes, uh, members of the mob, again, numbered in, in over, well over a thousand, maybe 2000, were shooting into the body, hundreds, hundreds of shots. Children were doing it, women were doing it. Uh, they later allowed the children with po to, to po poke the body with pointed sticks. It was just a horrific, horrific lynching. Um, the next morning, the police came and took, took away the body. Um, and uh, the, uh, the press handled this, both the St. Petersburg Time and the St. Petersburg Evening Independent uh, justified the lynching because there was this imputation that Mrs. Sherman had been sexually assaulted. So that meant that all bets were off. You didn't have to worry about law and order. You had to avenge the honor of the, honor of the uh, community. Um, and uh, poor John, Matt, John Evans, uh, who will never know whether he was guilty or innocent, uh, the other uh, man, Eugene Tobin, was in the Clearwater Jail, and a mob actually went to try to get him out and lynch him too, but they were stopped. And so he actually got a trial. I'm not sure it was a fair trial. I doubt if it was, but it, 
and he, he, he was executed in October of 1950 in the first public execution in, in, in St. Petersburg history. Uh, but the, the accounts of the, uh, of the lynching in the press were absolutely lurid. And I mean, the Tampa Tribune criticized it. Most of the other newspapers, both New St. Petersburg and the rest of the state uh, said, this is what, a, what an honored society does when a member of its, uh, the female sex is uh, violated. Uh, so that was the, the most spectacular lynching in St. Petersburg history. There was one more uh, 12 years later, Parker Watson, um, who was uh, a, uh, he was a kind of a petty thief. Uh, he, he was a purse snatcher. He had, he had been uh, charged with nine different counts of, of grabbing women's purses and running with them. Uh, he was being taken to the Clearwater Jail. Clearwater is the county seat. Uh, by three policemen, and they were um, sort of uh, ambushed by several masked men who took him away in handcuffs and, and murdered him, shot him. Uh, and there's evidence, circumstantial evidence at least, that they, they tortured him by pouring carbolic acid on his face. Uh, when, when the body was taken to the coroner, uh, it was clear that he had white scars on his face and the, the head of the detectives claimed, well, that must have been from the, um, the embalmers, the, the African-American uh, funeral home, they, they absolutely said that was not a, true at all, that it was carbolic acid used as, 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 as torture. Um, now this, this time, and I, this may be a slight amount of progress, but not much, the, the press was outraged by, by the, the Parker Watson lynching. They condemned it uh, as, a, as, a, as a detriment to the tourist trade, to the growth of the city, uh, kind of a, a boosterism. There didn't seem to be much sympathy for him uh, at all as a, as a human being, but at least they, the propriety had, had changed. Uh, and uh, this, this third lynching um, uh, was at least greeted different in the, in the public, public sphere. Um, after this, there were many examples of, of police brutality. Uh, Doc Vaughn, who was this legendary police chief from 19... Uh, 36 to 1945, who, uh, uh, in a sense, murdered several prison, pr prisoners uh, in the in the jails, and was eventually he he went like like Bull Connor in Birmingham. He went a little bit too far, and they eventually got rid of him, thankfully. Um, but uh, the lynchings were really when the system broke down, when uh, when uh, there were there there was a lot of uh, what you might call legal lynching, uh, uh, stretching the legal justice system to maintain the Jim Crow system. But those were the three examples when, uh, uh, which were, were used, of course, to strike fear in the hearts of the black community to, to maintain the, the Jim Crow system and the, the, um, uh, the, the social hierarchies and racial hierarchies of the day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Arsenault. Now, Dr. Julie Armstrong will talk to us specifically about lynchings of women and children, as well as some of the lynching protests. Dr. Armstrong. Thank you. So yes, tonight I want to talk to you about a rarely discussed topic, which is lynching of women and children, as well as anti-lynching activism, because I, I see these two topics as being related. And uh, let me explain what I mean. Conventional wisdom sees lynching as a form of frontier or extra legal justice where individuals take the law into their own hands because they perceive that it's non-existent or too slow. Um, that lynching occurred out West as an affair between cattle rustlers and heroes like Clint Eastwood, or that it took place in the South uh, with white men punishing black men for raping white women. But these ideas aren't exactly fully true. Back in 1892, anti-lynching activist and journalist Ida B. Wells called this belief the old threadbare lie that white people used to justify mob violence. More contemporary data uh, gathered by organizations such as the Equal Justice Initiative and scholars such as Stuart Tolney and Ian Beck proves Wells right. So let's break it down. Several different groups kept lynching statistics during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And depending on who was doing the counting and the time frame that they used, uh, there were at least 4,500 to 5,000 documented lynchings in the United States. About 80% of those were African-American men 
primarily in the states of the uh, former Confederacy. Of these numbers, only about 30% involved accusations of rape, and most of those were spurious at best. A black person could be lynched for anything from an accusation of a serious crime, as we've seen, uh, such as murder, or for simply failing to observe Jim Crow social codes, like looking at a white person directly in the eyes. Those of us who study lynching today, as other speakers have said, um, Think of the phenomenon as racial terrorism. It's a form of violence that undergirded white supremacy uh, designed to keep African-Americans in their then perceived place at the lower end of a socioeconomic hierarchy. The lynching of women and children illustrates this point most clearly and most tragically. So about 200 women were lynched in the United States. And as far as I know, statistics were not kept specifically by age, but one can look through the record and see again and again, 17 year olds, 16, 15, 14, and on down the list. Sometimes women and their children were lynched together like Laura Nelson and her son LD, who was 14. They were killed in Okima, Oklahoma in 1911. He was accused of stealing and she was accused of shooting the sheriff who came to look for her son. Or consider Mary Turner killed in Valdosta, Georgia in 1918 for threatening to seek justice against the mob members who lynched her husband. The men retaliated against her by torturing, hanging, burning and mutilating Turner and then removing and killing her eight month fetus. So again, this is a brutal, horrific history that has very little to do with rape or with justice. And let's look more clearly at this idea of rape. I, I said that many of the accusations were spurious and here's a couple of examples. In 1944, 15 year old Willie James Howard of Live Oak, Florida was accused of passing a flirtatious note to a white girl. And the next day her father and two of his friends picked up Willie James, they hogtied him, they forced him into the Suwannee River while they held his own father captive at gunpoint watching his only child drown. Uh, just over 10 years later in 1955, 14-year-old Emmett Till was lynched in Money, Mississippi for allegedly flirting with or whistling at a white woman named Carolyn Bryant. Bryant's husband, Roy, and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, were eventually tried and found not guilty of uh, Till's murder, but later they confessed to journalist William Bradford Huey in an infamous uh, Look Magazine article that they ha had indeed killed the boy. And to make matters worse, a few years ago, Carolyn Bryant told historian Tim Tyson that she fabricated her story. So it was all made up. Now, anti-lynching activists tried for decades to draw upon stories of female and child victims to counter that rape myth and argue that lynching had less to do with punishing alleged criminals than with maintaining white supremacy. And it's hard for us today to, to wrap our minds around this, to listen to stories of those like Mary Turner and Willie James Howard, and to realize that these activists faced an uphill battle, but they did. Um, Turner's story generated a huge outpouring of response from creative writers, artists, journalists, and organizations such as the NAACP, who put Turner at the center of their 1922 campaign for the Dyer Bill, which proposed to make uh, lynching a federal crime. And the bill passed the House, but not the Senate, where Southern Democrats filibustered it to death, arguing still that lynching was a legitimate form of punishing rapists. Now, that was pretty much the story throughout the 20th century as bill after bill went down in defeat. In 2005, the Senate apologized for its role in refusing to criminalize lynching with eight holdout senators from, you guessed it, the states with some of the most highest numbers of mob violence. As a Florida native and NAACP activist and writer James Weldon Johnson stated in 1919, most white Americans don't condone lynching, but they don't condemn it either. They didn't think of themselves as violent or racist, 
but they did enjoy having the privilege of being on the upper end of that perceived socioeconomic hierarchy. And they turned a blind eye to the violence. Now, some white people did step up to fight back, including those of the Association Force of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching, founded in 1930 to say, no, no more, not in my name. And numbers did decline in, mid, in the mid 20th century, but the violence didn't really end. Uh, Emmett Till's death in 1955 was another moment like Turner's that galvanized the fight against lynching. Uh, Till's mother, Mamie Till Mobley, held an open casket funeral in Chicago for her son so that the tens of thousands of attendees could see what had really happened to him. And pictures of Till's grossly disfigured body were published in Jet magazine, and then they circulated uh, throughout the news media nationally and internationally. And scores of civil rights movement activists point to Till's death as a wake-up call for themselves and for the nation. But before we get too confident about how far we've progressed, it's important to note that, again, an anti-lynching bill recently went through Congress, passing the House in 2019. Yes, I said that right, 2019, but stalling in the Senate in 2020, especially, uh, specifically through the objections of Kentucky Senator uh, Rand Paul. So as the Equal Justice Initiative works with local groups across the country, including those in the Tampa Bay area, to install historical markers that commemorate the lives lost, I want you to remember people like Mary Turner, Laura and L.D. Nelson, Emmett Till and Willie James Howard, and think about how important it is for us to tell the truth about our shared history and how important it is to keep seeking justice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Talking about the local initiatives, we have now Dan Boxer and Andrew Walker discussing the community remembrance projects that are occurring in their communities. Discussing the projects in the Pinellas area, we'll start with Mr. Walker. Hello, um, thank you um, for having the, uh, our coalition to be a part of this uh, discussion. Um, starting with the history of the coalition, um, it, I think about, um, there are certain words that, that that come to mind like justice and uh, even anger and, and service and giving and especially giving voice to people like uh, Mary Turner um, and others and John Evans. Um, uh, history, faith, um, all of these uh, uh, ideals and virtues and um, uh, you know, ways of, of of uh, expressing uh, ourselves um, uh, came together uh, with a group uh, called the Pinellas Remembers uh, Community Coalition. Um, this group was uh, formed uh, as a result of these individuals seeking uh, a way to be a part of, of creating a appropriate memory um, so we came together uh, and under the auspices and the direction of the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson's group out of Montgomery, Alabama, where the museum uh, exists on lynching and also where the uh, memorial to the individuals that were lynched in every county in, in the United States um, exists. Um, and so we're a group of people who a lot of us didn't know each other. Uh, some of us, uh, however, uh, had worked together on other projects. Um, the Equal Justice mm -hmm. Initiative uh, requires that in forming a coalition that the tenets of coalition building, the themes of coalition building, um, such as collaborative effort, bringing resources together, uh, actually be um, um, adhered to. Uh, we have a common uh, set of virtues or ideals that we uh, try to live by as we work together in a group because groups uh, forming together who often uh, 
include individuals that hadn't worked together, need to have a, a thematic um, direction. Um, and so the EJI gave us that direction. Um, and so from that, um, we were asked to build this coalition. And over the past year, the coalition has met um, uh, monthly. Um, initially, prior to COVID, we met in person uh, at St. Augustine's Church. Um, members such as NAACP, uh, the University of South Florida, individuals from Eckerd College, the city of St. Pete, um, uh, individuals from the uh, Foundation for Healthy St. Pete, who is uh, a major donor uh, to the project, along with um, another uh, donor um, uh, that uh, the Tampa Bay Rays that has uh, made a significant uh, donation to this cause. Uh, our financial um, uh, coordinator or uh, manager of funds, the Urban League. Um, Jackie Hubbard is the co-chair. Um, and uh, she has been with the project for um, a number uh, from the very beginning, along with uh, Gwen Reese. The organization was formed and officially formed in 2019. Um, the main impetus of the uh, Equal Justice Initiative in working with coalitions is to have the coalitions um, create uh, wording and language that would be appropriate to give uh, recognition in memory and to bear witness to the loss of lives by individuals that were lynched in the local community. So the coalition worked on creating this language that was representative uh, and appropriate for the memory of uh, John Evans and Parker Watson um, and other individuals that were lynched. In addition to the marker, we are um, working to partner with or have partnered with Pinellas County Schools. Uh, that was another key requirement to have a coalition is that we had to agree to involve students uh, in essay and art activities to deepen their understanding um, of the history of lynching in Pinellas County specifically, but in the US. So the coalition has uh, finalized the marker aspect. And at this point, uh, the marker uh, will be uh, presented um, and um, unveiled in a ceremony that is COVID restricted. Um, and that is gonna take, take place on Tuesday the 23rd of February. Uh, again, because it's COVID um, restricted, we will be providing a Facebook uh, coverage of this event uh, to, so that the attendance would be limited um, we also, the city of, uh, are collaborating with the city of St. Pete, who's been the, a very strong collaborator in this event, donated the uh, land. Uh, they will be providing a, a presentation, uh, I believe through their uh, video channel. If not live, it will be you know, played at a time in the future. Pinellas Remembers has a webpage and a Facebook page. Uh, more details about the unveiling of the marker uh, can be found there. Uh, again, we encourage that you watch this because this was this particular unveiling is meant to be a, a more intimate um, event. We will be having a future event that will be open um, freely to the public. Also, you can find out more about uh, future events related to the 
uh, award ceremony that will recognize the winners of the essay contest that uh, was done in collaboration with Pinellas County Schools and some of the art uh, presentations. So again, the, the, the coalition, um, the, the key aspects uh, in summary were forming a coalition that met on a consistent basis that worked to get a marker um, placed and hosted a student uh, essay, literature and art uh, uh, contest uh, in collaboration with the local school system. So those were the, the, the three requirements in working with the East Equal Justice Initiative out of uh, Montgomery. It's been a pleasure to work with the group. Uh, we have uh, stormed and normed and collaborated and discussed and you know really worked uh, together to come up with a uh, these goals that the Equal Justice Initiative uh, asked us to accomplish. And so it's been a, a, a real labor of love and uh, an, an inspiring experience uh, that we believe will give voice to those individuals that experience such uh, horrific um, experience in, in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker, and thank uh, everyone in the coalition for working so hard to achieve that goal. To talk about the Community Remembrance Project in the Sarasota Manatee County region, we have Dan Boxer of the Boxer Diversity Initiative. Go ahead, Dan. Good evening, everybody. And thank you, Andrew, because you took a lot of our thunder, but I just wanted to talk a little about how the, our Community Remembrance Project was formed here in Manatee and Sarasota. And we're a little different because we're actually two counties, we're Sarasota and Manatee. And many of the lynchings that took place, took place when Sarasota and Manatee were one county, which took, which was in 1921. And it all started for us when Lytton, my wife and I went to Montgomery, Alabama, I think it was about one month after EJI, the museums opened, the uh, Leg EJI Legacy Museum and the National Museum for Peace and Justice, which most people refer to, I believe, as the, Leg the National Lynching Museum. And to say the least, and let's hear all the other people talking, it was a very, very moving experience to see it. And I had to read one paragraph from a well-known architect who talked about the lynching monument just after he visited, after it opened. His name is Brian Lee from New Orleans. He says, of the memorial, it is a space that takes an almost unimaginably difficult topic, the individual horror of lynching and challenges its visitors to engage with it, to put lynching in its rightful context as a tool of racial terror throughout this country's history. It is easy to be struck by the emotional gravity of it all. It is much harder to rationalize the depth of cruelty it requires to commit and allow such atrocities. And I think Dr. Arsenal really brought it home on a local level. And we went through the memorial and as many people who visited know about the, rectang the steel rectangular hanging monuments from each county where a lynching took place with lynching victims of each county engraved on it. And a duplicate of that laid horizontally outside. So what does one do when you're from a Southern state 
you go to try to find your own place. And we found Manatee, the monument. And we saw to our horror, six lynchings. Henry Thomas, Sam Ellis, Wade Ellis, Ruddy, William English, James Franklin. And our director of research here, Hope Black actually found out another person, Lewis Franklin, which we are doing research on now. So we went back and we knew that EJI was trying to get local counties to bring these replicas there. And I had the good fortune of knowing uh, Jackie Hubbard, who's on this call, fellow panelist and a great friend of ours. And she told us of the work that was being done in Pinellas County and really helped us get started. So we formed a coalition which included Minnesota Asala. I sometimes get this wrong. I think it's Asala, Minnesota, and I hope that uh, David Wilkins forgives me. And the Sarasota African American Cultural Center, the new cultural center that has been being organized by uh, someone named Vicki Oldham and Dr. Sorry, Judge Williams, who's on the call here, and Newtown Live, which celebrates the culture and the history of Newtown. And that was the basis of our coalition. But to get this to be successful, and I'm, I'm not going through all of EJI's requirements that Andrew did so well, we had to find out if we had the support of the community. So we circulated a request for support, not for money, just to support a lynching memorial, a lynching marker to be in this area. And one of our worries was that we were two counties. Can Manatee not be interested if it's in Sarasota and vice versa? And to say the least, the response was overwhelming. We've had over 300 pledges of support from individuals from all walks of our community, Manatee, Sarasota, everywhere, and almost 80 organizations, big ones, small ones. We've had uh, the, the Manatee uh, Commission support it. We've had the Manatee um, the Bar Associate Diversity Committee. I think Lori Dorman's on the call who helped so much on this. We've had the city of Sarasota. So all in all, we had a very, very strong support. And we were aided by publicity in the Herald Tribune, Sarasota Herald Tribune, which asked the question, will the community accept a lynching memorial here in Sarasota? And as a result, we got another 80 people supporting, supporting the group. So that gave us the ability to make a proposal to EJI, which we just put in before Christmas. We then talked to EJI who have been incredibly helpful. And I think, I hope Trey and Kiara are on the call and our proposal was accepted, I think it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So we're much farther behind. We're already planning a soil collection project. Uh, Asala, Minnesota is working on the education com component with the, the uh, schools. And we're really looking forward to taking this whole project forward for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for all the hard work that you're doing um, in Manatee and Sarasota to get this project done. <clears throat> in the time that we have left, we're going to try to field a few questions from our viewers. I'm going to ask our production assistant, Bobby, to help me with that. Uh, do we have any questions from our viewers?
Okay. The uh, first question is from Bren Ross Green. Is lynching a crime today in every state? I'm going to ask uh, Attorney Hubbard if she could feel that question. Okay. And the question was, is lynching still a crime in every state? Or a crime in every state? Well, murder certainly is. Um, lynching has not become a federal crime. Assault and battery and murder are is a, those crimes are crimes in every state. Probably a good time. A follow on to that question was from the same person. Is there an official definition for lynching? Must it always include hanging or can it uh, involve other atrocities to be defined as such? Well, it's usually thought of as a, an extrajudicial um, killing, usually by a mob, and punishment for a crime that may or may not exist, except okay. in the mind of the perpetrators of the lynching. Okay. Question from Ali Vaught. How was lynching used to boost the economic systems for white people and keep African Americans in poverty? I'm going to ask Dr. Arsado if he would respond to that question. Sure. Well, lynching was part of a whole complex of control mechanisms for racial control. Uh, it's all sort of interlocking. You know, economic discrimination, political discrimination, um, the criminal justice system, instilling fear in African Americans so that they they know their place, and that was the I think the essential motivation to not just to express the outrage of the community for an alleged crime by a member of what was considered to be an inferior race and uh, an affront to the community. But uh, it was it was it was meant to send a message uh, that uh, you need to stay where you are. Um, the bottom rail should stay on the bottom, and it was a essentially a, a long term reaction to the to Reconstruction, the notion that you could have a society with liberty and justice for all, which was not at all what white supremacists had had in mind. And so lynching is a is a means of enacting fear. And uh, just as whipping was during the were enslaved people, it wasn't just the person who was being whipped, it was the lesson that was taught to the rest of the rest of the community. Let me ask if Dr. Armstrong wishes to add anything to that uh, response. Yes, thank you for asking and, and I do. Um, I, in many cases, uh, the, the success of African-American success or black success drew the attention, drew attention to uh, lynching victims. So there's a, a scholar named Caritha Mitchell who's written about this. And this sort of echoes what uh, Dr. Arsenault said that uh, lynching is, is a form of a, a continuum of uh, what she calls know your place aggression. And uh, so very often it was economic success or uh, with with a case like someone in, in, in named Anthony Crawford in South Carolina, uh, or it was uh, you know excess success in uh, you know voting rights or something like that with someone in, like J July Perry in uh, 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 or, okay. uh, Orange County, Florida. So it's it's sometimes the success itself, whether political success or economic success, is what. Uh, drew the ire of white supremacists who, like Dr. Arsenault said, want, wanted to, you know, maintain those very strict uh, hierarchies. And it was about sending a message. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, any additional questions, Bobby? Yes, uh, first one's from Roxy. Where will the markers be placed? Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, Attorney Hubbard if she would respond to that in, as far as Pinellas County, and then I'm gonna ask, uh, Dan Boxer about Sarasota, but let's start with Ms. Hubbard uh, as far as where the placement of the markers will be in Pinellas. Um, 
John Evans was lynched at the intersection of Second Avenue South and what is now Martin Luther King Jr. Street or 9th Street. And the lynching marker <clears throat> will be placed uh, in the area where he was actually lynched. And we're very thankful and grateful to the city of St. Petersburg for giving our coalition uh, permission to put the marker uh, there. And uh, I would also like to thank the city of St. Petersburg for all of the direction, cooperation, <clears throat> and uh, taking the lead on getting permits and things of that nature for us. Uh, there, the level of cooperation from the city of St. Petersburg really, it's unparalleled. It's, it's just wonderful. And uh, the deputy mayor, Dr. Kanika Tomlin, has always been an advocate for us and uh, a believer in the history of lynching and the fact that people should not forget. And therefore, having a monument to uh, the actual victims of lynching at the uh, location where the lynching actually occurred was very important to us and was very important to the city. Okay, thank yeah, you. Charles, and, Charles, let me just yes, reiterate ahead, the, the importance of that. and. And something I uh, would be remiss if I didn't cover, and that's that we have uh, at least 80 organizations. It, it's hard to name them, name them all, uh, but the uh, I want to also make sure I uh, covered that uh, Gwendolyn Reese from the African American Heritage Trail uh, was the is also the co-chair along with uh, Jacqueline. All right, thanks, Andy. Uh, and for Dan Boxer, I know you're early in the process, but in terms of the location, has that been discussed? Yes, uh, and we put it in our proposal. Unlike uh, St. Pete, we do not have the exact locations for many of the, uh, any of the lynchings. We have a researcher, Hope Black, who's been working tirelessly to try to find it. And we, there is a possibility we will locate it, but we don't have a definitive place yet. And because of the uh, establishment of this Sarasota African American Cultural Center, which is to not, I hate to use the word celebrate because this isn't celebration, but to talk about the history of African Americans in Sarasota, Manatee as a center, everybody who's been involved with our uh, project agreed that the best place would be at this cultural center, which is gonna be located on Martin Luther King Avenue and Orange, no, uh, Osprey, sorry. And that will be the case. All right, thank you, Dan. And Bobby, I think we'll do one more question before we close out. So do you have one more question? Okay, uh, for the other questions that we do have, will we be able to get answers back to those individuals after uh, uh, Well, let's do this. If let's, let's, uh, let's agree time-wise, let's do three more. So, okay. and then the others will figure out a way of answering those. So uh, go ahead with three more questions. Okay, first one is from Dr. Marcia Kendall Smith. Have any of you tried to contact relatives of lynching victims? All right, I'm gonna ask uh, Attorney Hubbard because I, and, and Mr. Walker, because I know that they have been uh, on the ground working uh, the details. So uh, have you been able to contact any victims or families of any victims? Let me just say that a, a, the family of one of the victims contacted Dr. Ray Arsenault directly. And at the time Dr. Arsenault was contacted, he was on his way out of town. And so he contacted me and asked me if I would follow up on trying to reach this family member of one of the victims, which I did. 
uh, wrote letters on numerous occasions to um, the family of one of the lynching victims. And they pretty much indicated that they, they, they didn't really feel that they wanted to have anything to do with the ceremony. However, about approximately a week ago, I received a call from uh, a person who indicated to me, who asked me, uh, she, she said that she has located uh, the family of um, one of these, the same lynching victim. And she wanted to know if the, if the family said that they would participate in the ceremony, would we uh, like that? I passed that on, I think, to the, the um, unveiling committee or either the publicity committee. And everybody agreed that if, if in fact, the family of one of the victims changes its mind and decides that it really would like to participate in the initial unveiling ceremony, that we would make room for them. Absolutely. We would love to have the family of one of the victims uh, be present at the unveiling. Uh, and let me ask Dan Boxer, has there been any contact with any victims' families in the Sarasota Manatee region? The answer is not yet. Again, we're working on it, but I have a sidebar to the question. Uh, the, the wife of our former president of Asylum, Minnesota, Dr. James Stewart, Carolyn Sheffield, her grandfather, whose name was Caesar Sheffield, was lynched in Valdosta, Georgia and the, in 1915. It's not directly relevant, but it brings it very much home to our local community. Sure. Okay, uh, Bobby, another question? Okay, from Jan Neuberger. During the course of the period of racial terror lynchings, was there a comprehensive effort on the part of religious organizations to end this brutal practice? No. Well, let me let me ask uh, let me ask Dr. Armstrong and maybe Dr. Arsenal. I'll start with Dr. Armstrong. She is very she like Danny animated. My name she's so animated we talk. I hear uh, <laughs> somebody's voice. Anyway, uh, 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 Jackie Hubbard answered the question short and sweet. No, <laughs> not really. But there were uh, there were faith based organizations that that did do the good work. Uh, one of them was the uh, Commission on Interracial Cooperation, which uh, was rooted in the Methodist Church and you know out of Atlanta. And certainly there were in faith based individuals, you know, religious individuals who participated. But as a whole. Uh, religious organizations stayed away from this topic as a political hot button. Okay, uh, Dr. Arsenault, any knowledge of no, any organization? Yeah, what, that, Julie, Julie's absolutely right, but um, there, there were some attempts behind the scenes. There was a group called a Fellowship of Southern Churchmen, which was interracial, which met secretly in the mountains of North Carolina in the summers, and they had a lot of discussion about it, but they they had to keep it under wraps. Uh, they, they worked through other organizations like the Southern Regional Council because they were afraid they would lose their congregations. They'd be defrocked if it became, became uh, public. And there were also uh, a number of African-American ministers who uh, discussed these things. But again, the, the National Baptist Convention, which was the dominant denominational organization in the South, uh, kept a pretty tight lid on it. Uh, they're, they were more in the tradition of Booker T. Washington and not of W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, so there was not nearly as much as there should have been, but uh, the, the NAACP, of course, and there were a number of religious figures in the NAACP hierarchy who worked very hard in the 30s, of course, for the anti-lynching law, but alas, they never were able to be successful. Okay. Bobby, for, the, yes, for the last Show question, uh, for a question for Dr. Arsenal. In the 1950s, or was it 1962, lynching murder, how did the mob know where to find the accused and that he was being moved? It seems he might not have been set upon if he was in police custody and being moved, if his movements weren't known. Was it collusion? 
I, 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 you said 1962. Do they mean 1926, Parker Watson? I uh, might have might have transposed it. That's possible. Yeah. Well, I think um, at some level there was, I think, definitely collusion. Again, we'll probably never know. There, there was a formal investigation ordered by a local judge, and uh, the governor actually got involved, and there was a pretty serious investigation. And but they were a lot of it had to do with the the the, the acid stains on Parker Watson's face. Um, they did, they they worried more about that, the torture, rather than who was responsible. Nobody was ever ever uh, indicted or brought to justice in any way. And, but the, the three policemen, in all likelihood, uh, there was some collusion. Uh, not, there's no hard and fast evidence of that. Um, but, um, and that was often the case. Sometimes it was unwilling collusion. Uh, jailers were overwhelmed, sheriffs were overwhelmed, and they tried to, maybe at a certain point to protect prisoners, but then they realized that their own life was at stake and they often just uh, surrendered uh, to the mob. So if that's the kind of collusion, I think it was very, very common. And there, there were a number of lynchings which came very close to being police murders. Uh, there, there, there was one in 1937 in St. Petersburg of J.C. Hun Honeybaby Moses, uh, again, was killed by Doc Vaughn, the, the legendary infamous police chief that I mentioned earlier. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of violence involving the police in maintaining order over the black community, but they, they often didn't technically fit the definition of lynching as a, as a vigilante, you know, of, of more than two people committing murder um, in the name of the name of the community. Uh, they're, they're, but uh, so I think the answer is, uh, I, th I think it's highly likely there was collusion in the Parker Watson case. Uh, this might be a good one just to end on. Uh, the question from Patty was, is there or will there be a Black History Tour of St. Petersburg? All right, I'm going to ask either uh, Andrew Walker or uh, Jacqueline Hubbard to answer that question. There, okay, go as ahead. I mentioned, yeah, as I mentioned, the um, uh, Gwendolyn Reese, who's with the African American Heritage Trail, so that's the one of the official organizations that does uh, tours of the historical African-American community. Okay. And, and I'm pretty certain that the uh, this monument will be added to that tour. Okay, and uh, before we close out, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Hubbard, do you have a couple of minutes? Do you wanna sum up uh, basically uh, this effort uh, and sort of give us your final thoughts before we uh, close out. Well, let me just say this. There are so many aspects to African-American history that people don't know about, but have had ramifications through generations of African-Americans because of the psychological and physical abuse that they have been subjected to since 1619. And each period of history seems to have its own uh, type of abuse, white against black. Slavery, the enslavement of black people for over 250 years is just an amazing period of history, which you could probably teach a course on. And then after the Civil War and prior to the Civil War, when we had the abolitionists and we had people like uh, Frederick Douglass, who constantly tried to get people to remember the atrocities that had been committed against people of color. And then you had W.B. Du Bois who talked about the issue of color is gonna be the, the, the question of the 20th century. Well, it's still the question in America. America has not come to grips with its history. America refuses to teach its history or acknowledge the kind of racism that's so endemic to this country. And until that happens, there need to be people like us in Sarasota, and in the coalition 
in St. Petersburg to remind people of this history and to bear witness to it. America has a long, bloody path of racial oppression that has led us to where we are today. And we're not in a good place. I don't care what you say. You look at any indication of racial inequality and injustice, and it exists in the United States. We have mass incarceration, particularly of young black males. We have inequities in terms of medical experiments that have been committed on African-Americans, such as the syphilis study at Tuskegee Institute that lasted for 40 years until every single participant died, even though the participants in that study thought they were being treated for syphilis, they were not. You had 600 black men as part of that study. And so you have a, a, an inbred suspicion on the part of African-Americans to any kind of medical intervention or experiment that could lead to their deaths. And unfortunately, if you look at the, the, the disposition of the, of the COVID vaccine, you see it again. If you look at the neighborhoods where the COVID vaccine has not been uh, dispensed in an equitable manner, it's usually in the poor and black areas of that particular city. If you look at education, it's never recovered from the kind of segregation that it was subjected to after Brown versus Board of Education and even before Brown versus Board of Education. And the kids, the younger people bear the brunt of this. It is amazing to me how African-Americans have managed to not only survive this brutality, but in many instances to survive it. And one of the institutions one of the groups of institutions that we have to give credit for, for our survival, are the historically black colleges and universities who educated most of us and continue to do so because education really is the way out of this morass. And that's why our community organizations are so important because ASALA exists to teach African-American history. Pinellas remembers and the coalition exists to teach people about lynchings, to bear witness to what happened to African-Americans, all of which is in the interest of education and hoping that once educated, people can have meaningful discussions about the kind of racism that exists in America and what we can do to reconcile ourselves to it, to have truth and reconciliation and racial reconciliation in this country. But you can't have it until there's an admission that these atrocities actually occurred and that people were damaged by them. And that's my closing statement. Thank All you. right. Thank you so much for that. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. I do want to specifically thank the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Eckerd College, the Community Partners, uh, St. Pete uh, Sala, the Boxer Diversity Initiative, and Eckerd College. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Good night.